This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce you all to Dr. Arnold Meshkoff. Uh, a little bit of background, he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a BA with honors in biochemistry and then remained there for medical school. He did an internship year at HUP and then a year of cardiology research at Temple, then moving on to Yale to complete his clinical cardiology fellowship. As far as his background from clinical practice, he has spent many years in both private practice and in academics. Initially was in private practice for about 15 years, then established his own solo practice, and then went on to join the faculty at Emory where he rose to the rank of professor of medicine. He then uh, returned to private practice in 2015 where he remains currently. He has held several appointments, including the director of the Echo Lab at the University Medical Center uh, of Princeton, uh, director of cardiology clinical services at Temple, and co-director of cardiology grand rounds. On a personal note, it was my pleasure to train under Dr. Meshkoff at Temple. He is very committed and passionate about the professional development and education of fellows and residents. As a fellow, I learned the importance of work-life balance from Dr. Meshkoff when he began taking photography classes. I think I was a first or second year fellow then, um, and he's an avid sailor. So this morning, he's gonna to talk to us about the history of catheterization of the heart from self-experimentation to angioplasty. The floor is yours, Dr. Meshkoff. All right, well, good morning. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today and hopefully to enjoy with me some of the amazing details of the people's lives who created modern cardiology. Uh, to me, cardiology without heart catheterization is not cardiology. Uh, this is not your typical grand rounds presentation where I'm gonna talk about uh, the latest data on one particular topic, but it's a reflection on some of the very important history of our profession. And certainly as a resident and our fellow, or even as, as an attending, uh, there's so much to learn that people very rarely take the opportunity to look back uh, and think about and learn about the people and the ideas that created uh, the modern uh, cardiology skills that we have. And I think that that's an important thing to do from time to time. Hopefully, looking back at some of these great people and their struggles and ideas will give people inspiration for their own ideas and innovation in the future. So, just some brief background about the book that I wrote called Chasing the Widowmaker, The History of the Heart Attack Pandemic, How It Came About. And uh, E.G. Oma described uh, my clinical background. I won't go through that again, uh, except to say that I'm now entering my eighth decade of life, which is really hard for me to say, but is true. And at that point, I thought I was very happy with what I had done, the patients I had helped, many students I had taught, including uh, E.G. Oma, in my years at Temple University in Philadelphia, I really didn't think I had anything major to contribute and thought about retirement. But in 2015, I read a book that I had wanted to read for several years called The Emperor of All Maladies, The Biography of Cancer by Siddhartha Mukherjee, a Columbia oncologist. This was a brilliant book carrying the reader from the ancient times to the present with the struggle of doctors and patients to the much too, with the much too often deadly de disease of cancer. In the latter part of the book, McCarthy updates the reader on the changes that have occurred in, in cancer science and therapy, using the body's immune system to attack the disease instead of horrendous doses of toxic chemotherapy. The book ends on a positive and hopeful note. But about 250 pages into this long book, I became a little annoyed. As I knew where McCarthy was going, at the book's end. Cancer, of course, is still one of the most important and deadly diseases of the human race. I realized, however, that no one had written an account of the truly remarkable advances in the understanding and treatment of the all too common disease, still the number one killer in the world, that you and I deal with on a daily basis, atherosclerosis and the myocardial infarction. We know that although this disease still claims too many lives, that the progress we have made in the cardiology world in the last seven decades has been astounding. And of course, we're not done. 
We all know the term Widowmaker. I first heard it as a medical student in 1973. I realized that I've been chasing the Widowmaker my entire career. I wanted to try to write a book about this quest and how the brilliant work of so many people provided me and all of us in this audience with the knowledge and tools to save so many lives. I'd never written a book, but I started and just kept writing, loving doing all the research and connecting with a Nobel Prize winner and people from my past about their major contributions to cardiology. I took two years to write the book and then almost a year to get it published, making many missteps along the way. But with the help of two wonderful editors and a book publicity firm, the book was, a, was put on Amazon and other websites as of April 1st of last year. So this morning, I wanna talk about part of the book, a portion that along with the electrocardiogram, Invention, invented in 1905 by the Dutchman Willem Einhoven, created the field of cardiology, and that's the cardiac catheterization. I hope you will enjoy these stories about three major characters, Werner Forsman, Mason Soans, and of course, someone very well known at Emory, Andreas Grunzig. I suspect most of you recognize at least two of the names and some all three, but the details of their lives and how they did what they did is fascinating to me and I hope to you as well. Before digging into the details, I want you to try imagining being a doctor seeing patients with heart disease a century ago and now in 1922. Most of the patients you would have seen had valvular heart disease, often mitral stenosis as a result of rheumatic fever. Penicillin was decades away. You would see people with congestive heart failure, usually elderly patients with high blood pressure, and you would treat them with digoxin, first used in the 18th century by the Englishman William Withering. And you could use one of these easily, easy, easy to use devices. Oh, how come it's not advancing? Uh, trying to advance the slide, which advanced earlier, but now it doesn't want to advance. Uh, ooh. Chris, any suggestions? There we go, sorry. You can see the electrocardiogram and you can see how easy and convenient the electrocardiogram was to use in 1922. Uh, so there really there wasn't much else you could do for your patients other than tell them to rest most of the time, take digoxin if they had shortness of breath or atrial fibrillation and nitroglycerin if they had chest pain. You knew that most of these patients with rare exceptions had a fatal disease. Cardiology was not much of a specialty. In the physiology labs at the time, there was new and potentially useful information that was accruing. As early as the 1840s, the Frenchman, I'm sorry, Claude Bernard, right, was, to, was investigating the hemodynamics of animals. He studied the hearts of animals and was able to understand the difference between systole and diastole and measure the pressure in all four cardiac chambers of large mammals. Others contributed to the knowledge base, including Auguste Chavot. But these discoveries were far away from any potential use in human beings with heart disease. You might wonder why. I love the word shibboleth. It has a Hebrew origin. It's the part of the plant containing grain. It has a convoluted history and several meanings. But for my purpose today, a shibboleth is a belief that's so ingrained in the minds of a group that its validity is never challenged. There have been many shibboleths in medicine. For instance, the one that said that peptic ulcer disease is caused by excess acid. In the 19th and early 20th century medicine, such a shibboleth took its origin from the Gospel of John. In Latin, it's noli me tangere, don't touch me in English. John reports that the risen Jesus said this to Mary Magdalene after the crucifixion. Scholars have interpreted this to mean that Jesus was indicating to Mary that after death, the link between human beings and Jesus must be spiritual and not physical. Now I need to link this religious text to cardiology. Doctors at the time were instructed by their mentors, including the acclaimed German surgeon, Theodore Billroth. And I think some of you in the audience remember that Billroth I and Billroth II operations for peptic ulcer disease. But Theodore Billroth taught his students that under no circumstances 
said a surgeon touched the human heart. And on occasion, surgeons did see a live beating heart, patients undergoing lung surgery or attempted repair of severe chest injuries. If a surgeon tried to repair injury to the heart, it was a shibboleth. The heart would fibrillate immediately or massive bleeding would result, both with a rapid fatal outcome. No one challenged Bill Roth and his successors in this belief. But in the third decade of the 20th century, this man who was younger in, than in this picture at the time, a German named Werner Forsman thought otherwise. He was fascinated by the animal work of Bernard and Chavot. If they could insert tubes into the veins of animals and push them down into the right side of the heart to measure pressures, remove the tubes, and the animals were none worse for wear, well, why couldn't you do that in human beings? Bill Roth be damned, he thought. Now, if Warner Forsman was not a brilliant medical student, and in 1929, through a family connection, he finally landed a surgical residency at a community hospital outside of Berlin, the August Victoria House, not a large academic medical center. His idea of catheterizing the heart caused him sleepless nights trying to figure out how to do that. He told no one, but he knew it, but he knew that he would need help, need help doing this task. He began to quote sweet talk, and that's a phrase from his autobiography. One of his nurses at the hospital, Greta Ditson, telling her about his idea and showing her pictures of the animal work of Bernard and Chavot. After thinking about Forsman's idea, she agreed to help him, and in fact agreed to be his subject for the experiment. One morning in October 1929. Forsman saw that all the ORs in the hospital would be free that afternoon, a perfect time to do his experiment. He spoke to Nurse Ditson, and they gathered the materials they would need. Forsman was going to use a urinary catheter to place into his heart by threading it through his brachial vein. He and Ditson went into an open operating room, and he strapped her to the OR table, explaining to her that the local anesthetic he was planning to use to numb up her arm could make her dizzy. She was comfortable just staring at the ceiling <clears throat> out of sight of Forsman, but Werner Forsman had no intention of using Nurse Ditson as his subject. He injected his left arm with an anesthetic, waited a few minutes, sliced open his own vein, using his right arm to push the urinary catheter about a foot into his arm. Ditson still had no idea what he was doing. Forsman released her, and she was astonished to see him standing there smiling with a catheter in his left arm. He told her to call the x-ray technician. Together, they walked down the hallway to change medicine forever. Arriving in the x-ray department, Forsman realized that the catheter was not far enough in to reach his right ventricle. So he pushed it in another, fo another foot and then asked that the x-ray be made. This x-ray showed for the first time a catheter inside of a human heart, a heart that was still beating normally. Forsman removed the catheter and closed up his arm vein quickly. Word spread throughout the hospital about his self-experiment. But now it was time to meet with his boss, Richard Schneider, the chief of surgery. Forsman thought perhaps he was going to be fired. But Schneider, who had actually known of Forsman's idea and told him he shouldn't do it, in fact refused to let him do it, realized the importance of what had happened just a few hours earlier in his small suburban hospital. He told Forsman to tell no one else about his experiment, but to quickly put together a publication. Forsman submitted the paper to a well-known German journal, and his case report in himself, along with the X-ray image, was published in early November 1929. Now, Forsman remained at his hospital for several months and eventually ended up performing nine catheterizations on himself, as well as in several patients with septic shock managing to obtain crude pressure measurements from the heart chambers. Schneider told Forsman that he should apply to become a surgical resident at the very famous Charity Hospital in Berlin, an institution much better suited for him to continue his work. Forsman applied and was accepted, but his stay at Charity was a major disappointment. The chief of surgery, Ferdinand Sauerbrook, was an arrogant, well-known surgeon and he thought that Forsman's ideas and experiments were ludicrous and dangerous. Werner Forsman had done his last heart catheterization. But Forsman still had a career to pursue, as well as a family to support. 
He quickly performed his normal duties, quietly performed his normal duties as a resident. And when Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, he joined the Nazi party to further his career. In his autobiography, Forsman is very clear that he had no genuine allegiance to the Nazi party, but he did what he had to do. Now, some of that history is controversial. Werner Forsman spent many years as a doctor for the German Wehrmacht and became a urology specialist. At the end of the European war in May, 1945, he was captured by the Russians, but managed to escape by swimming across a river where he surrendered to the Americans. He was released, found his family, and he and his wife, also a doctor, began a practice in a small town in Bavaria with Warner doing general medicine and urology. His life was quiet, but good and stable. In 1950, a local pediatrician in Forsman's town returned from a conference in Geneva where the major topic was the cardiac surgery for quote, blue babies, prim primarily those with tetralogy of Fallot. The pediatrician mentioned to Forsman that in order to perform the cardiac surgery, that the children needed to undergo a procedure called a cardiac catheterization. He asked Forsman, weren't you involved in doing those procedures decades ago? Forsman was stunned and went to Geneva to see what the new type of surgeons, heart surgeons, were actually doing. When the history of his old experiments became known, Forsman was asked to participate in a film made about the cardiac catheterization procedure. There was something else completely unknown to Warner Forsman. Two Columbia University pulmonary medicine professors in New York City, Rene Cornand and Dickinson Richards, knew of Forsman's work by the 19, in the late 1930s and early 1940s, and they began performing right heart catheterizations in order to study the pulmonary circulation. They had been publishing their work for over a decade. The final shock for Forsman came in 1956, when he received a telephone call from Sweden. The caller informed him that he, Cornard, and Richards had won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. And these are a picture of the three of them. Forsman became a sought-after sought commodity, but he had a blunt and often disagreeable personality, and he moved from several hospitals as the chief of surgery. He published his autobiography in 1974 and died from congestive heart failure in 1979 at the age of 75. From our modern perspective, the achievement at Werner, Werner Forsman may seem modest, but that's only because of the truly remarkable advances that have occurred in diagnostic and therapeutic cardiology since Werner Forsman put a urinary catheter inside his heart. Forsman, I think, was a great example of what the science fiction writer Arthur Clarke, who wrote <clears throat> 2001, A Space Odyssey, said, first law, when a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he's almost certainly right. But when he states that something is impossible, he's very probably wrong. Second law, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. Third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So for those practicing the growing discipline of invasive cardiology, the recognition that the right heart could be studied with a catheter led to more adventuresome endeavors. Could you place the chef place a catheter into the left heart. Early ideas were that you could place the catheter in the left ventricle by going through the right side through the intraatrial septum, a common procedure today, but felt to be dauntingly dangerous in the late 1940s. The idea did gain traction, that did gain traction was that a catheter placed in the brachial artery could be used, pushing the catheter against the flow of blood into the great vessels and the aorta. But in addition to the bleeding risk of an incision in the arm, another risk was that the catheter pushed across an opening and closing aortic valve could tear the valve and cause acute aortic regurgitation. The cath lab team at the Cleveland Clinic thought there was a group of patients for whom the risk of aortic valve trauma might be less. This is an x-ray image of a patient with syphilitic aortitis, now a very rare entity in the developed world which causes dilatation of the aortic root and aortic valve leaflets and might provide 
a safer experiment to put a catheter into the left ventricle. In 1950, a group led by Henry Zimmerman at the Cleveland Clinic proved that they could do just that and performed the procedure safely, publishing their findings in the Journal of the American Heart Association circulation. So by the early 1950s, cardiac cath labs had become a feature in almost all academic medical centers and crucial physiologic information in patients with disease of the valves, heart failure, and congenital heart disease was obtained on a routine basis. The data provided a crucial roadmap for the first generation of true cardiac surgeons. Surgeons aided, aided dramatically by the, oh, let me go back one. By the invention of John Gibbon of, Temple, of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, who invented the heart lung machine in 19, and completed his project in 1953 after 20 years of work with he and his wife. And this is a picture of Dr. Gibbon with the first patient for whom he used the heart lung machine to repair an atrial septal defect in 1953. The practicing cardiologists in the 1950s likely felt very gratified that the great advances in the field offering patients with previously fatal diseases the opportunity for surgical, correct, surgical correction. But there was still a black hole of knowledge, a frustrating inability to even make a specific diagnosis of the disease that had reached epidemic proportions, coronary artery atherosclerosis, the cause of angina pectoris, acute myocardial infarction, and sudden death from ventricular arrhythmias. Cardiologists at the time prided themselves on their ability to determine if a patient's chest pain was due to angina or not, conclusions that often led to profound influences on a patient's work life, sex life, and general activity level. Even to this day, we in the field like to think that we can be very certain about our history-taking diagnostic skill. But where were the data? In patients with, quote, classic angina, our diagnostic skills are very likely accurate. But when patients have atypical symptoms, how good are we? This is not to mention that until the 1990s was the general cardiology world aware, aware of not only the atypical symptoms of coronary atherosclerosis in women, but the fact that the incidence of death from coronary disease was as high in women as it was in men, although at a later age. The belief that myocardial infarction was a disease of men was another shibboleth that took many years to destroy. And I must add that a great deal of that destruction was done by a faculty member at Emory, Nanette Wenger. There needed to be a much more accurate way to be certain of the diagnosis of coronary atherosclerosis. And a chance occurrence opened this door. Many think that the history of science and medicine has a predictable progression from basic science to then clinical trials, just like placing bricks in a wall. But the reality is different. Again, the breakthrough came at the Cleveland Clinic. This is a picture of Mason Soane's MD. He was in the right place at the right time and had the tremendous insight to capitalize on a chance occurrence, a chance he never would have taken intentionally in a patient. Mason Soane's was born in Mississippi in 1918. And when he was finishing medical school, he told one of his professors that he might want to become a cardiologist. He was told it was a quote, nothing specialty. Fortunately, Soans ignored the advice, and his workaholic ethic drove him to become the head of the cath lab at the Cleveland Clinic in the mid-1950s. He drove himself and his students incessantly, smoking his cigarettes constantly, often holding one in a hemostat while performing catheterizations, usually in children with congenital heart disease. His language was punctuated with frequent curse words. His lab was described by one of his trainees as a, quote, Three ring circus played out every day. His nickname of Little Napoleon was well deserved. He built himself what he called his duck blind so that he could do his catheterizations at a lower level than the patient's table. And this is a picture of Stones in his duck blind. So, October 30th, 1958, was just another day in the lab for Mason Stones. He was studying the aorta of a 27 year old man with aortic and mitral valve disease. Soans prepared to shoot a routine aortogram, and although he never admitted it, he likely placed the catheter too close to the aortic valve. 
He injected the contrast dye and immediately recognized what he had done. The catheter tip had burrowed into the orifice of the right coronary artery. The dye created an image of the small right coronary artery, and Soames thought that the patient might die quickly, as the shivalif of that time maintained that the injection of contrast dye would shut off the blood supply of the artery instantly, causing either an acute myocardial infarction or a malignant arrhythmia. Soans thought quickly and yelled at the patient, cough, God damn it. The cough did hasten the clearing of the dye in the artery, and the patient was no worse for wear. Soans immediately understood the implications of the accidental first coronary artery angiogram. He knew that in a cath lab, he could for the first time attempt to visualize coronary artery atherosclerosis, a process that the pathologist knew was too often present in patients, but had never been imaged in living patients. Returning to his office, he told a secretary, quote, we just revolutionized cardiology. So much for a slow gradual progression of knowledge and techniques. Within a week, Soane began badgering his college colleagues to refer patients with chest pain who were thought to have coronary artery disease for him to do angiograms on. He and his primary collaborator, Earl Shirey, employed engineers and physicists to improve their catheters and imaging technology. They worked diligently on developing the manual dexterity and skill to insert a catheter into the orifice of the coronary artery through the brachial artery in the arm without tearing its inner lining. Soans and his colleagues decided that they wanted to be sure about their technique and how their results correlated with the patient's symptoms, the electric cardiogram, and their doctor's assessment of the cause of chest pain. Was it atherosclerosis or not? They studied 1,000 patients and still no publications. Only when they did the next 1,000 cases did they feel confident enough to share their data with the cardiology world. The Cleveland Clinic results drew four important conclusions. The first related to the patient's electric cardiogram. We were all taught in medical school about the importance of the Q wave as a diagnostic finding of, acute of a previous myocardial infarction. And at least in this group, a Q wave on the EKG, 99% of the patients had a major occlusion. In patients with typical chest pain with exertion, 95% had a major occlusion. Those with atypical chest pain did not have major occlusions. Chest pain at rest, 60 to 75% had some degree of an occlusion in at least one coronary artery. These patients, the gray area patients who have chest pain with rest, still plague us to this day and require further functional tests such as nuclear imaging, or in recent years, fractional flow reserves in the cath lab to try to start out if a patient's chest pain was due to significant atherosclerosis. The details in the publication about the atypical chest pain patients are unclear, but I suspect that most of these patients had the kind of chest pain that we see often today. Sharp pain, lasting seconds, and unpredictable at onset. The studies from the Cleveland Clinic proved that Mason Sons was correct. The safely performed coronary angiogram did revolutionize cardiology. On with the information from coronary angiograms, the luminaries in Cleveland, primarily the Ar Argentinian immigrant, Rene Favalaro, began performing coronary artery bypass surgery less than a decade later. Mason Sons helped drive the field of invasive cardiology for the next 27 years but his cigarette smoking caught up with him and he died of lung cancer in 1985. Rene Favalaro called him, quote, the most important contributor to modern cardiology. The Soans method of left heart catheterization was a standard of care in the early years of the 1970s, until the early years of the 1970s, excuse me. For those of you who remember or even did a Soans catheterization, as I did as a fellow, you know that the method of cutting down on the brachial artery, isolating it from the vein, pushing a catheter up through, over the shoulder and into the heart was often challenging. Even more problematic could be repairing the artery after the procedure. I well remember the occasions we needed to call in a very aggravated vascular surgeon to help repair the artery. There was a doctor in Sweden, a radiologist, 
who thought that he had a better and safer, easier way to access arteries for imaging. For imaging. This is a picture of Yvonne Seldinger. Many radiologists adopted the Seldinger technique quickly, but using the method to image the heart was still off limits. And here, of course, we're all familiar with We're all familiar with the Seldinger technique of placing a needle into the artery, uh, then a guide wire and uh, removing the guide wire and putting a, a, a dilator catheter, dilator tube into the artery and then following it with a catheter. We're all familiar with that technique. Most radiologists adopted Seldinger's technique, but using the image, the method to image the heart was still off limits. But in the 1960s, a man from Southern California decided he would give up his career as a family doctor in Washington State at age 39 and try to enter a radiology residency. He was rejected by all but one program, the one at the University of Oregon. Melvin Judkins was determined to change cardiology by developing an easier method to image the heart. Experimenting with many types of plastics, Judkins was able to invent a series of preformed catheters using the Seldinger technique to access the artery. By the late 1970s, most laboratories had shifted to the Judkins technique, which allowed a much easier training for cardiology fellows, and I think had a great deal to do with the fact that cardiac catheterizations began to be done at community hospitals, not just large academic medical centers. Judkins technique was the standard of care for many years, only recently being replaced by the newer method of radial artery catheterization. So in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when I was a, a fellow, cardiology had many tools to use. CCUs, external defibrillators, cardiac catheterization, bypass surgery, and now in addition, additional medication to treat angina other than nitroglycerin. The beta block blocker propranolol, was developed in the mid 1960s by a Scotsman named James Black, who won the Nobel Prize for his work. Dr. Black was inspired to find medication that would blunt the effect of adrenaline and help people like his father, who always developed angina when he lost his temper and died of a myocardial infarction. Many in the field felt that cardiology was doing all that it could to care for patients, even though prevention was just a fantasy. But again, science advanced suddenly. And from an obscure source, an East German man, born in the early days of World War I, World War II, and sent with his brother by his mother to escape to West Germany after the war. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure that most of you recognize this man, and I would say that if you're at Emory and you don't recognize this man, then uh, you have some, some reading to do or some asking questions. This, of course, is Andreas Grunzik who performed the forced coronary artery angioplasty in a human being. His story is pretty fascinating. And like many people who, who created breakthroughs in medicine, his inspiration actually came from someone else who came before him and is much well less known. Grunzig was born in East Germany, as I said earlier. His father was in the Nazi army and was killed, leaving his mother to care for he and his brother. As the communists took over East Germany in 1946, Mrs. Grunzig became convinced that neither of her sons had a future in the communist bloc. Andreas and his brother fled to West Germany and Andreas enrolled in school. He was a good student and wanted to pursue a career in medicine. He was accepted to medical school in Heidelberg, Germany and graduated in 1964. Like many young medical graduates, he was very unclear about what he wanted to pursue and he bounced around from several residency programs. But his life changed when he attended a lecture given in 1969 by Charles Dodder, an eccentric Oregon radiologist who was determined to change radiology from the discipline of just reading images to a therapeutic one. Dodder's talk that day in 1969 was about his work using catheters to clear an atherosclerotic leg artery using telescoping catheters. Dodder was often called Crazy Charlie, but then in 1964, he saved the leg of an elderly woman with severe ischemia, a patient who was told that amputation was her only option. 
As he began to perform more sexual, sexual procedures, he was thought to be less crazy. And in fact, his procedure became known as doddering. Andreas Grunzik was enthralled, and he knew that his future was in using catheters to deal with atherosclerosis. In the early 1970s, Grunzik obtained a position at the University Hospital in Zurich, Switzerland. And in his spare time, he began to try to create better catheters than the stiff rods that Dotter was using. But his real goal was not just to treat claudication and severe leg ischemia. He thought he could invent a catheter that could be inserted into the coronary arteries. And the catheter would have a revolutionary feature. It would wrap wrapped inside an inflatable balloon, inflatable balloon, one that could be inflated when the tip of the catheter was in the right position outside in the coronary artery. This idea was pretty novel, but simple. Smash the plaque into the wall of the artery to create a new channel for blood. But the engineering was difficult. Grunzik spent all of his spare time working with his wife, Michelle, and a woman he had met working for the chief of surgery at the hospital named Maria Schlumpf. Night after night, they tried different materials to try creating a balloon that could withstand significant pressure when inflated, enough stability to accomplish the job. All the balloon materials they tried failed miserably, either leaking air or bloating at the ends when inflated against resistance. But Grunzig was not deterred. He finally struck gold when he spoke to a retired expert in plastics named Heinrich Hoff. Hoff listened to his problem and quickly suggested that he try using polyvinyl chloride. PVC, the same substance used in plastic Coca-Cola bottles. The PVC could withstand five to eight atmospheres of pressure and was easy to mold and shape. By 1974, Grunzig was ready to try his invention not on the coronary arteries, but on the leg vessels, just like Dotter had done. Grunzig catheters were successful 80% of the time, a marked improvement over Dotter's results. He had also invented a two-channel -chamber, two catheter, one channel to pump air through this to inflate the balloon, and a second to inject contrast dye to confirm the area of plaque blotch. In 1976, Grunzik presented his data on 220 cases at the American Heart Association Convention. Many in the audience realized his next goal, the coronary arteries. This is an image of some of the data that he presented several years later about his uh, work in the coronary arteries. But there were skeptics, including Dr. Spencer King, the head of the cath lab at Emory, Emory, who was convinced that, quote, this will never work. His mind would change a few years later, especially after September 17th, S September 1977. On the 16th of that month, Grunzig successfully dilated a classic Widowmaker lesion, which of course you can see circled at the top of this image, in a 38-year-old man named Dolph Hartman, eliminating the man's need to take 15 nitroglycerin tablets each day. Mr. Hartman, I believe, is still alive and has never had angina again. This is the result of the angioplasty in October 1977, and then an image of that vessel 10 years later in 1987 showing Excellent result in the angioplasty. Andreas Grunzig had become a rock star of cardiology. He did a few more coronary cases and presented his data at the American Heart Association meeting in 19, November 1977. Those of us who have attended many of these conventions know that the audiences are usually very quiet during the presentation, some of them thinking about the pointed questions they might ask the speaker when he or she was done with their presentation. But when Grunzig showed his pre and post angiograms after his angioplasty, the crowd erupted in applause. Mason Sons was in the audience and reportedly began to cry, saying it's a dream come true. Grunzig's fame came quickly. In August 1978, his bravado and confidence in his skills did something breathtaking. 37 cardiologists and radiologists came to Zurich to watch Grunzig successfully perform an angioplasty on television. The gold rush was on as cardiologists around the world wanted to learn how to perform angioplasty. But Grunzig, in spite of his enormous ego, was a careful scientist. He published data on 264 patients in 1979, reporting a 60% success rate 
but also a 33% rate of a new disease, restenosis from scar tissue formation within months of a successful angioplasty. In addition, 10% of his patients required urgent coronary bypass surgery because the balloon catheter had torn the inner lining of the artery dissection. <clears throat> By late 1979, it was clear to Grunzig that he needed to come to the United States where he would have the support of lab space and personnel that he was still being denied in Zurich. Many of his European professors found his ego abrasive and immature. Dr. Spencer King, who had never initially thought that Grunzig would be successful, invited Dr. Grunzig to Emory in Atlanta. Grunzig took Atlanta by storm. His personal charm and charisma, in addition to his skills in the lab, attracted everyone at Emory. He wore his cath lab like a French beret and wore clogs in the cath, in the cath lab. He kissed the hands of women and reminded some of the actor Omar Sharif, co-star of Lawrence of Arabia with Peter O'Toole and Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand. Grunzik continued to be, uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Grunzik carefully selected his patients. He offered his procedure to those with severe angina, not patients who had had a recent myocardial infarction. At the time, the standard of care for an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction was to infuse thrombolytic drugs as quickly as possible, a medical treatment that also revolutionized cardiac care and reduced mortality. In the early 1980s, the angioplasty frenzy gained more steam. Many more cardiologists learned the procedure and the device companies became involved in producing superior catheters, knowing that their return on investment would be huge. Although Grunzig himself was very careful about patient selection, others were not, and undoubtedly many angioplasties were performed on minimally symptomatic or even asymptomatic patients. This gave rise to much more government and insurance company scrutiny of the procedures, which continues to this day. Andreas Grunzig pretended to be productive at Emory and trained many in his procedures. His personal life changed, however, as he divorced his wife and married a much younger Emory medical student. He and his second wife bought a magnificent home and frequently held lavish parties at their home, sometimes with Andreas entering the party from the second floor of his home dressed as an Arab sheep. He had already become a motorcycle fan while he was living in Switzerland and took his love of speed and excitement further in America. He took up flying. His behavior raised a good number of eyebrows in the largely very conservative medical community at Emory, but no one could question his work. <clears throat> he and his wife purchased a home in one of the barrier islands off the coast of Georgia, <clears throat> and Grunzig loved flying there for a weekend or a vacation. In October 1985, Grunzik took off from Atlanta, knowing that a hurricane was plowing through the Gulf of Mexico, thinking he could fly away from the storm. You all know the end of this story. When his plane was found several days later, in addition to his wife, their two dogs were in the plane. They were named Jin and Tana. There's little doubt that Andreas Grunzik's contribution to cardiology was enormous. Over the next two decades, data developed by William O'Neill and Cindy Grimes in 1993 showed that acute angioplasty was superior to thrombolytic therapy for urgent treatment of ST segment my elevation of myocardial infarction. And this belief persists to this day. In addition, a huge dent was made in the incidence of restenosis when two radiologists from the University of Texas, San Antonio, <coughs> Julio Palmas, and Richard Satz perfected the first iteration of coronary artery stents. Although Palmatz had the idea in the mid-1980s, he could not figure out how to develop an effective device until a workman in his home left a metal lathe in Palmatz's garage, a tool with a series of staggered openings. And of course, we're all familiar with how, how stents are deployed and what they do in decreasing the incidence of restenosis. In the early part of the next century, another major advance in angioplasty occurred with the development and success of drug eluting stents. And combined with dual antiplatelet therapy, the details of which took over a decade to achieve success, the results of angioplasty have become remarkable. 
It's been a great pleasure for me to research the lives and careers of these remarkable people. Their achievements in the world of invasive and now interventional cardiology are now the stuff of legends. The stories of Forsman, Sons, and Grunzik are different, but all of them had the same goal of developing effective treatment for patients with atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. Since the time of Forsman, so many other people have made great contributions. The invention of the coronary care unit, the medical treatment of angina, the treatment of congestive heart failure, the treatment and prevention of malignant arrhythmias, the unraveling of the cholesterol odyssey, and prevention of acute myocardial infarction. And the recognition, of course, that the widowmaker's work is not limited to married men. I think that a doctor trying to help cardiac patients a century ago would be speechless. I hope that the next century produces many more unimaginable advances. Science moves and stops and starts. The research must go on. The Widowmaker has been approached, but not corralled yet. Thank you for allowing me to present my talk today to you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Meshkoff. Uh, I'm gonna have our faculty put any questions they have in the chat, or if you would like to ask your question directly, just um, you can either raise your hand or indicate so in the chat and I'll turn over uh, the floor to you. Well, thank you for the thorough historical perspective about the field of cardiology, specifically interventional cardiology. From a period when um, Bill Roth was told no one should even touch the heart to Mason Sons, the originator, the father of left heart catheterization, and then Andreas Grunsing, who then revolutionized uh, interventional cardiology with the first balloon angioplasty. Um, how rewarding has it been for you just to think back or take part in this investigative work about the history of cardiology and, and being able to share this with others in the field? Well, it, it's been great. I mean, I, I had so much fun doing the research. It took me a long time to think about the areas that I wanted to delve into. And then I spent hours and hours, and my wife can attest to that, uh, you know, on the internet, uh, looking up articles uh, from the past. I spent some time at the National Medical Library in Bethesda. And I think most rewarding, I called many people around the country, uh, working up the nerve to uh, call people like uh, Michael Brown uh, of Brown and Goldstein, who discovered the LDL receptor. I used uh, the fact that uh, Dr. Brown and I went to the same high school, college, and medical school. And uh, finally, after four or five emails and phone calls, he got on the phone and talked to me, and helped me write the chapter on uh, the LDL receptor in my book. Uh, I spoke to people from the Framingham Heart Study, uh, and I spoke to uh, the son of a man named John Goffman, uh, who was the one who uh, first discovered that there was different layers of lipoproteins by ultracentrifugation. So I think the most rewarding part was talking to people. Um, I spent several days with my former chief of cardiology at Yale, Barry Zarrett, when I wrote the chapter on nuclear imaging. And uh, it was, it's just been very rewarding um, to not just do the research, but contact with people who I hadn't spoken to, unfortunately, in, in many years. And now I've become friends with them again. And uh, Dr. Zarek sends me his poetry to read. And uh, uh, I sent him some articles I wrote for practical cardiology. And um, it's, just, it's just been a very rewarding experience and, and a surprising experience. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very glad I did it. I'm very proud of the book. And um, uh, I hope it will be well received by others. As we look towards the future of cardiology now, what do you think as we are now moving into uh, the field of uh, structural heart disease? And I can't imagine what um, some of the giants of cardiology would think now um, when we talk about TAVIR and a lot of the structural procedures we now can do on the mitral valve and advancements in cardi cardiology from that standpoint. What do you think as you look in the, towards the horizon for cardiology and where we might be in another 30 to 50 years? Well, look, I don't think there's any question that uh, structural heart disease has taken over uh, as the primary focus, particularly in the, in the training programs, um, in the treatment of valvular heart disease. 
Uh, certainly, mitral regurgitation, in my view, still remains a, a very difficult task uh, in terms of deciding whether repairing a valve or replacing a valve is appropriate when you realize that for many of these patients, the problem is left ventricular function and not the valve itself. I think that debate will continue to go on for some time. Uh, but as a non-invasive cardiologist myself, the most exciting thing for me is prevention. And uh, we now have, uh, in addition to the statins, we have PCSK9 inhibitors. Uh, we now also recently, the FDA approved Inclosarin, uh, which is the messenger RNA uh, hypolipid lipid lowering medication, which can be given once every six months. And that's just incredible to me. And I don't know what, what the company is gonna charge for that, but uh, it probably will be a lot, but regardless, uh, and I think those of us who've used PCSK9 inhibitors have been really kind of stunned by the, the lowering of LDL that can be achieved and uh, presumably improve the prognosis of patients even with advanced coronary disease if their LDL is, is very lowered. I mean, one of my colleagues at Temple, uh, at Dr. Williams, who was the ch chief of endocrinology, uh, when people would talk about, you know, the, the pleomorphic effect of statins and so forth and so on, he should just shake his head and say, it's all about the LDL. It's all about the LDL. And I guess I tend to agree with him. So I think prevention is really uh, where we're headed uh, and structural valve disease. I think the aortic stenosis issue has been resolved. Certainly I have seen in my own practice, uh, you know, when, when aortic valve replacement when TAVR first came in, you know, the patients had to be very debilitated. They were, you know, in their 80s and 90s and not surgical candidates, but certainly in recent years, uh, I've seen a number of patients who've had TAVR successfully, uh, where as 10 years ago, they would have had open uh, cardiac surgery to replace the valve. So, but I still think mitral regurgitation is a problem. Mm, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm biased from the prevention standpoint that PCSK9 is being able to change the, the field of cardiology and prevent uh, recurrent events. You know, the discovery of PCSK9 is in reducing LDLs by about 60%. And as you mentioned, Inclisiran, which just received FDA approval this month, um, could also be very helpful for patients, especially due to how infrequent it has to be used. And I think that did answer Dr. Wenger's question, which is what do you see as the next frontier in cardiology? I think just to pivot on that point, though, Dr. Wenger's question is, um, as you said, you know, and it wasn't too long ago that heart disease was always thought as a men's uh, disease. And Dr. Wenger, being the giant that she is, that helped really change the trajectory of uh, women's heart disease and, and help those of us in the field understand that it is more than just a mass disease. Um, what do you think the impact has been uh, for the field of cardiology from the research that you did with women's heart disease? And, have we made enough headway in changing the perspectives of uh, the cardiologists? I, I think we have. I think the cardiologists are aware. Um, what I've seen, however, in patients is I still think that, you know, when you're sitting at, at your desk and you're talking to a patient and uh, it's a man and, and the, the wife is there, um, I think that many of the women still don't understand that their own individual risk of heart disease is as great as that of their husband. Uh, I still think that there's an education process that has to go on. I know that, uh, uh, you, you know, Dr. Crabb, Debbie Crabb at Temple uh, has been very active in promoting, uh, you know, women's cardiac health and uh, uh, getting the message out there to uh, uh, not to, in particular, our under, underserved communities, uh, the people who you and I took care of at Temple um, who don't have access to great health care and, and have poor diets, um, those patients, those people really need to uh, be educated and hopefully uh, will have a lower incidence of heart disease as they get older. But uh, that's, a, that's a daunting task. And I think it's more of a sociologic and economic task than necessarily a medical one. There's a question here from Dr. Pooja Mehta. Um, medical innovation and in imaging has also transformed cardiology. She's curious as to your thoughts about some of the tools that we're using now, such as stethoscopes, ECG, et cetera. <laughs> you think that uh, the next 50 to 100 years, these will become obsolete? That's a good question. Uh, 
man, I still like, I still love my stethoscope. Uh, but you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old dog at this, at this game. Uh, I still think that there's value in listening to the heart and listening to the lungs. I think there's something that is important about the physical touch of the doctor, uh, on the patient. I still believe that that's important. Um, and you know, um, just two weeks ago, um, I had a patient come in for the first time and, uh, she was referred by her family physician who said that she had a heart murmur. And um, <clears throat> when I talked to her, she had had a whole variety of peripheral vascular problems, lung problems. Uh, and I put my stethoscope on her chest and she had one of those, you know, three to four out of six aortic stenosis murmurs. And I was like, you know, <laughs> nobody told you about this <laughs> before. <laughs> so I still, I think there's still value in the physical examination. And of course, you know, as I was taught many years ago, and I think all of us were taught, you know, the history is pretty much everything. You have to take mm -hmm. a careful history um, and a uh, basic physical examination, certainly on the part of a cardiologist, I still think will be important. Um, I know that some people disagree with me about that. Why can't we do it? just do an echo on everybody? But I don't think that uh, Medicare and the CMS are going to let us do that. So I think the stethoscope is still a great value. Dr. Meskoff. Uh, Spencer King here. I enjoyed that so much. I don't have your book yet, but I certainly intend to get it mm. and have a look. Uh, one, one story, though, though along that uh, line of the early catheterization uh, is Otto Klein. And mm. sometimes I think uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, adventuresome as uh, Forsman was, uh, you know, he just put the catheter in the coronary and in, in the in the heart. But Otto Klein in Prague, uh, just the next year, un, not knowing anything about uh, Forsman, uh, catheterized uh, a number of patients and mm -hmm. measured uh, pressures in physiology. And so uh, I've always thought Otto Klein was getting a little short, uh, shorted on uh, the history of the development of uh, catheterization. What do you think about him? Uh, it's the first time I'm hearing his name. You're right. I mean, I, I was not able to uncover uh, the name out of yeah. it's, it's really It's really buried. And uh, John Douglas and I wrote a book in uh, about 35 years ago. And we included that because Willis Hurst had, had heard of it. And it turns out he, uh, he, he somewhere, I guess it was about... Uh, 1990, I was invited to Prague to, for the anniversary of this uh, this thing, and the the, the Czech uh, people were exceedingly uh, upset that he was not getting credit. But, uh, Otto Klein, yeah, he he, uh, he he did some good work, but it's it's like uh, it's like everything, you know, publish or perish. And and uh, uh, he published it, but it was in you know in Czech or something, and nobody ever saw it for for many many years. Right. But he did some very good work. All right. Yeah. Preceding, preceding uh, the uh, the work of uh, Cornon and Richards, who, who and my understanding is that Cornon and Richards were offered the Nobel Prize and that they uh, said, uh, well, you're forgetting about this guy that stuck the catheter in the heart the first time. I see. <laughs> so yeah. they invited, they invited uh, uh, the Nobel Committee to include. Include Forsman. Uh, Forsman, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's a very strange character. I mean, I, you know, I read his autobiography, and um, you know, certainly uh, his involvement with the, the Nazi Party uh, is controversial. Uh, in his book, he talks about some of the work that he did at the uh, when during the war uh, and some situations where yeah. involved with uh, you know dealing with prisoners and. Uh, He's, he's a pretty controversial figure. Uh, we we did a little teaching course in the Mediterranean with Willis Hurst mm -hmm. uh, running it. And there was a man on the, uh, on the ship who, uh, who was a, a physician in Kentucky, but he was from Berlin. He was a German mm -hmm. who had been a, a colleague, uh, uh, had known uh, Forsman very well. And uh, his comment to us was that uh, uh, Forsman was the 
stupidest man ever to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, he certainly didn't have any great academic achievements or credentials other than that one that was, I think he did one afternoon in 1929. So. Right. Well, it is now 8.30. Any uh, last questions from the audience? With that, um, Dr. Meshkoff, we thank you for your time and sharing again this historical perspective uh, on the field of cardiology. And uh, we uh, uh, enjoyed your talk. I will talk to you after your meetings this morning. All right. Thanks for inviting me. It was it was great fun, and uh, everybody have a, a good day and stay safe and uh, keep up the great work. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.